to episode number 41 of Reinventing School. I can't believe we've been doing this for just about a year. Um, happily, people are starting to get vaccinated. So what began as a project related to COVID likely will continue as a project related to education, which seems like a really good idea. So for the past month or two, we've been digging deep into curriculum, the what of what happens in K through 12 school. Um, what is it that we're learning and why? Uh, and how have we organized that? And what is the history of that organization? And do we think we ought to continue marching on with social studies and science and, and all of that? Or should we kind of take that out and erase the blackboard and start with some new subjects for the 21st century? Along the way, there are subjects that don't quite get oh, above the title status. Um, so not quite social studies, not quite math or science. But they're important, but they're sort of positioned in school as supporting players, physical education, um, maybe health on a good day, um, music for some students, visual arts uh, for some students, and farm languages. So we're now going through that set of subjects. We've had a very good discussion on an earlier, recent earlier episode about physical education and health and where those two uh, areas kind of overlap. Uh, we will be doing an episode about music education shortly, um, which will be great fun because we have some family involvement in that. Um, and today we're going to be talking about visual arts instruction. And I have a few different ideas that intersect here that I'm hoping that our guests and, and students, our professional guests and students will help sort out. And I'm sure there's a lot of issues that I haven't thought about. Um, the biggest of them is are we teaching craft or are we teaching creativity? And where does talent fit into all of that? Um, so that's one kind of big chunk. The second is, do we need it? Is this something that you necessarily should be studying as a K-12 student? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Um, and then related to that um, is just as a student being good at it or just not being all that good at it. And there's always a range of, uh, you know, of, of how skillful and, and, you know, full disclosure, I've been kind of on the better side of art uh, for a long time since I was in school. So for me, it's been a combination of fun and productive. Um, and when I compare it to Jim, that would be the opposite. So there we are just to get us started. Uh, so for some overview um, of maybe a bit of the history of how and why we all started doing this in school, the idea of visual arts instruction. Um, James, you, you, you probably have the broadest view uh, because you're at the university level. So could you enlighten us a bit, but begin by introducing yourself and where you are in the world and what it is that you do? Well, sure. Um, by way of introduction, uh, my name is James Rowling. I'm a, uh, the chair of arts education at Syracuse University. Uh, and I'm currently the um, president of the National Art Education Association. But prior to all of that, um, I was an elementary school art teacher. Uh, and prior to all of that, um, I was a young artist. I grew up in a household with an art studio in the middle of it. My father was a practicing artist. So that's, that's, that's what got me to where, uh, that's, that was my start, my origins. How did all of this start, the idea of doing visual arts education in school? I'm guessing that that was not part of the original design of public school, probably not the original design. I don't know, maybe it was in medieval times and, and all of that. But how, what is the history of this? Is this a similar history to teaching science or is, does it come, at, come into view in a different way? So you're actually asking several uh, questions there, which I, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, uh, take them one by one. Uh, for one thing, the I've I've always viewed the arts as and the sciences as twin peak twin uh, I'd say twin peaks in human cognition, human uh, uh, um, thinking or knowledge creation. Uh, often, one of the definitions uh, we hear about the scientific method is that it's a way of organizing what we know. Uh, so that we can, um, you know, uh, grow in our knowledge bases. But I've often pointed out that the visual arts are another way, design practices are another way of organizing what we know and what we experience. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's just as important uh, because it's been around perhaps even longer, there, uh, arguably, this, the scientific method. So um, 
how it gets into schools uh, uh, or, or the origin of that, that, that there have been books written about that. The, yes, you're correct in that there is an origin. One of the points of origin is the notion of teaching skills, uh, uh, the ideas of the idea of having folks uh, learn a, a trade uh, that employs the, the arts. But I think that hopefully in this conversation, we'll get to the point of understanding that, uh, and especially using the lens for me uh, that I've always uh, taken that I'm a creativity teacher, that it goes beyond craft, far beyond craft, goes far beyond the idea that the arts are the, for the purpose of expressing oneself. Um, because it expresses ideas and 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 uh, uh, knowledge bases and lived experiences and 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 multiple modes. But I, I'm conscious of my uh, time here, so uh, I'll start by just saying those things. Oh, great, yeah, you. Um, are you feeling as though and you're a student, right? So give us a bit about your life as a student. But are you feeling as though you're learning craft or you're learning creativity? And what do you think the balance is? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Jiwoo. Uh, I am a senior at University Prep in Seattle. Um, Which and, is a high school, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm in 12th grade. I guess senior means, could also mean I'm in my fourth year of college, but that's no. Um, and I guess thinking about art in my high school career, I think I came in as somebody who thought, you know, art doesn't seem as important as a lot of my other academic classes. And so I pushed art off. And this year, um, I'm taking three art, or I took three art classes. And, you know, it kind of came to my senior year. And I was like, oh, maybe art isn't as irrelevant as I thought it was. Um, what, are you so taking? Suddenly, what are you taking? Uh, yeah, so I took um, visual arts one, two, and three, just all in one year. Um, so that's kind of what happened. But I think kind of coming out of that thought process of, you know, art is useless. It um, made me realize, you know, art isn't just, you know, I have an object, I have an art piece, and this is my, you know, this is just crafting, and this is my craft and stuff like that. It, it became more of like, you know, my thought process. Um, and, you know, it's not just the motion of like going through art being done. I've learned nothing. Um, a lot of it was, you know, what does this art mean to me? And how did I get here? Um, so, you know, realizing that a lot of my creative process isn't here in my art and in like, whatever I'm making, it's also up here and in my head and how I relate to the art and how I see other people's art. Cool. Um, Trinity, I'm going to guess that whatever it is that's behind you was something that you made and that you've been making things for a long time. Can you give us a bit of the backstory and tell us what we're looking at? Uh, sure. So one of my students, um, Musa, he's from Ghana. So I work with immigrants and um, Trinity, I'm located in D.C., Washington, D.C. Um, and you're a teacher. Is, well, I am. I'm a, a supervisor. So I, I lead a department for arts, integration and culture. And I lead um, it in a school that is primarily for adult immigrants. So we start at age 16. So we do have high schoolers who attend um, and then all the way until like age 90. So it's based around language, uh, workforce uh, certifications and GED. Um, so I started a department um, around visual performing and literary arts. And one of my students, um, this right before the pandemic hit last year, we took about six weeks um, to do this mural behind me. So I'm going to move a little bit and not be oh, too cool. weird about it. Yeah. Um, and this is me basically, and G Wu got it in the private chat earlier, but this is me telling my story of my identities um, and it was really great to co-collaborate collaborate and, and create with a student because he's from Ghana. And so we really learned from each other and we incorporated pieces of like his own identity along with mine and then just created something really beautiful. 
So I am just to make mention, I am um, Filipina, I'm native Hawaiian and I am um, Puerto Rican, but I bring the ancestral knowledge of the Taino, the Ilocano and the Kanaka Maoli, which is also represented in this. And I'm gonna do this so you can- Yeah. <laughs> like the whole thing. So, and, and just to kind of bring attention to also, I um, in, incorporated a couple of other things that are important to me which is pride flag. So this is the pride, uh, the Puerto Rican version of the Puerto Rican pride flag. Um, as um, I, I, I stand as an ally with the queer community um, and a lot of my students as well. Um, and then here is the DC flag incorporated in the Koki, which is um, kind of like our sacred animal in the island of Puerto Rico, so. So there's this connection between art and social awareness, let's call it, that in theory you're learning about in social studies, but the story you just told suggests that we're learning maybe a lot more about it through visual arts, through music, maybe maybe music, maybe not, and we'll talk about that about a bit. Ray, give us a sense of um, your story and what you do and what you're thinking about all this. Sure, absolutely. Thanks so much for, for having me, Howard. Um, my name is Ray Yang. I am a art educator um, in Seattle, Washington. I'm also at University Prep. Um, and I've, I've actually had a career that's really spanned a little bit of everything. I've been, I've worked in museums, I've worked for community centers, I've done youth programs, um, teacher outreach, I've taught grad school, um, I've worked in large public districts. Um, and so now I'm teaching directly with students again, this is kind of the first love, right? You come back to this, like when I was doing administrative work, I felt so far away from students and and um, being able to kind of be on the ground with them each day is, is really amazing. Um, I, I have a background as an illustrator. And so I actually have a real love for uh, comics and graphic novels. I think that's an excellent way to access storytelling with students. Um, I loved hearing like what Trini was talking about with, with the piece behind her and like, you know, that there's a story there. And that's one of, one of the things that I think visual arts often does, which is really powerful. Um, and kind of connected to that question you were starting to bring up, Howard, about um, the social element. I believe that the visual arts are connected deeply to just about every social movement that we've experienced in this country and still right now. I don't know if you can see there are a couple of posters behind me. I got these up in my classroom and stuff. That's part of the Amplifier Project, which is based out of here in Seattle. But, um, you know, their work is nationwide and like it's connecting to um, social issues that are coming up, whether that's, you know, Black Lives Matter, whether that's the election, whether that's uh, the Women's March. Um, they're doing a campaign now on the um, vaccinations and, um, you know, like, Visual arts as a, as a whole, like they, they provide a voice, a visual voice for people to be able to express what they're feeling. And it's accessible and it connects to people in a deep way. And that's actually one of the reasons why I think it's so important that we're teaching it to our students, um, that we're helping them learn how to um, give voice to what they're feeling, what they're thinking, how to give voice to what they're learning in other classes um, and also like really deeply, how do they um, how do they then connect with others? Um, the visual is a great way to connect across cultures, across countries, um, and so we're kind of building that vocabulary for our students. We're building the the thinking skills, like what Jiwoo was talking about, about like how you process, how you express, um, and then and I think it's actually essential because it crosses into everything. Every you know, obviously, I'm biased. I, I'm an art educator, but I think that like the, the arts help everything, all the subjects all the time, because we do, you know, metacognitive skills and all those pieces. So the, um, we're laughing because um, we had a guest who's running behind Trinity in her mural. Um, so it's obviously not that important. It's obviously not as important as math, because math you do every day. Arts you do once a week or something, right? And the idea of trying to make something and you've got 45 minutes, including setup and cleanup, this is like a profound joke. This is not anything related to how you learn to make art. So what's going on? Like, why is it so unbalanced, especially if we're looking, as James, you were talking about, about the equal importance 
of arts education and a more traditional academic subject. And yet it looks like the academics won. And at the next state budget meetings, we're going to find out just how bad that is, right? So Andrew, when you introduce yourself, you're in a shirt and tie. So I'm going to assume you have some level of administration. Is that a fair? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I'm Andrew Watson. I'm the uh, city of Alexandria and uh, Alexander City Public Schools in Northern Virginia, right outside of DC. So Trinity is my neighbor, um, but uh, I'm the supervisor for the fine arts in that area. So uh, we, I don't see it quite that way. I see it more as you're working with an art teacher over the course of all of your elementary career versus your classroom teacher who actually is probably gonna have some art in their class as well. So, I mean, I think to me, it's in our schools, we have arts integration schools. We are starting to work with STEAM in some of our schools, which is another way of thinking about using art a different way. Um, to me, you have a little bit of art kind of sprinkled into everything, and then you go hard in your art class. But and math to, has a little bit of math sprinkled into everything too, but somehow they get the kids from K through 12 for a full period every single day, no matter what. I'm yeah. guessing that's not your setup. You mentioned K through six. Yes. What happens in seven through 12? You still having the kids every week or how, how often? No, how no, often? no. It's a class like any other. So you have them twice, a, uh, two to three times a week, every other day, just like you would with anything else. The only real difference is it's an elective. So that's it a is big a difference, difference, no? Yeah. Hmm? Isn't that a big difference? It is a big difference. Okay. However, that's not true of just our area. That's also true of um, of music and the other arts. And it's also true of CTE classes. So your engineering classes, a lot of your tech classes, you kind of have this uh, two segments. You have CTE the- CTE means computer technology E. <laughs> career in technology E. Thank but you. yes, it, it involves more than that. It, it's, uh, but it's a wide range. In fact, some of our art classes are actually run through the CTE department as well. Okay. So why is it- unbalanced. Why doesn't everybody have an equal piece of the pie? That has a lot to do with our history as a country and our history of how we view education. And also, I mean, obviously, you have to be able to read and write for anything. So that, draw, that no? literacy, literacy is so important. Um, so it, that that is in some ways, uh, I wouldn't say it's more important than what we do, but it gives us access to a lot of the things that we're doing as well. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with that. I do think that as you grow from into other areas, um, it should be, we should have more that is not elective. So in some states, they actually have at least one art class and that their high school career that is not. But things are also changing a lot too. And the view of how we view arts is changing a lot. So, I mean, really you have a very traditional view that says, you're preparing artists, designers, and others that are going into jobs in the arts. But then you have what's really happening, which is we're nurturing those soft skills, like you mentioned creativity, but also visual communications, critical thinking, uh, dealing with ambiguity, storytelling, like Trinity mentioned, um, and problem solving. And these are important to many fields and in many careers, but it's also important part of being an engaged citizen. And more important than that even, is that making art is part of being human and it's part of every culture and every age. So I do believe that there's a real shift here in Virginia. We just uh, redid our, um, our uh, standards for the arts. And really we did a lot of how it's, it's incorporating the five C's of 21st century thinking. And that, that, is, um, that has been a huge change in how we view it in our, in our uh, state and in our school district and seeing that those soft skills that we teach in the arts far more authentically than we do in many of our other subjects is really a, a, a key part of the base of education. So as you're, as you're explaining this, I'm thinking, so those fundamental skills that you need to operate in the 20th or 21st century, so you, reading seems like a good idea, right? Being able to write seems like a good idea. Uh, numeracy seems like a good idea. Somewhere in there, there was a group of people, probably guys, who went, yeah, you know what, drawing, 
drawing, we're going to forget it. They, don't, they need to know how to write, but they don't actually need to know how to visualize an idea. So drawing is optional, but writing is mandatory. I would have liked to be in that room. I'm sure you guys would have liked to be in that room too. So uh, Chrissy, tell us what you think if you could be in that room today and also give us a sense of who you are and, and all that. Hi, I'm Chrissy Pondon, and I am the visual arts department chair at the Uncoa School in Fairfield, Connecticut. And I think I'm actually in a really interesting position because my school is an independent school that values the arts highly. So kids, I teach middle school grades, which we say is fifth through eighth grade. And I see my kids three times a week for 45 minutes. So they're getting a lot of art and they have it throughout their time with me. Um, so that's four years of having art that much. So we really do put a lot of emphasis on how important it is and how much it really is affecting what they're learning in other classes. Um, I think it's interesting. Of, when they get a lot of art, what are they getting? What's in the bag? It's a great question um, for me. And you, you had mentioned, you know, drawing as a skill and yeah, we do drawing, but drawing is just such a small portion of what they're learning in my class. And truly, I think James, you mentioned earlier um, about this being about creativity. And I think that's something that people have this uh, misunderstanding that creativity is something innate and that you cannot foster it and you cannot do anything to make yourself more creative. And that is fundamentally untrue that you can completely encourage it. You can create environments that are going to uh, help kids feel that they can take risks and they can do things that are going to um, help them learn how to think divergently. And, you know, in, in math, I think we, we tend to think of, you know, here's the right solution and what you do to get to that right solution, but there still is only one right answer. In art, it can be anything. And we, we need to value the fact that kids are coming from different places and coming up with multiple solutions to a same problem. I mean, that is innovation. So we can absolutely do things in the classroom to help them develop these skills that are worth so much more, I think, um, than what they might be learning in any other subject. Caroline, how much of this is, uh, it sounds right to you and tell us about you. Well, hi, my name is Caroline and I'm a senior at TC Williams Titans. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie, Remember the Titans, but that's us. Um, oh, wow, cool. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I was really, I really agree with um, what she was saying before. Like, I think a lot of people tend to stray away from creative kind of activities because they think as an artist, they have to take on a whole certain identity. Like there's a label around the like, term artist. Um, and I always tell my family, like, all of you are artists, you just haven't realized it yet. Um, and I think uh, separately, what uh, Mr. Watson was talking about before, um, and um, the one before I forgot the name, but um, there are certain skills that you develop in art making that can be applied to all other subject areas. Um, I think it's in a great way to like foster emotional maturity, emotional like processing, and um, just a way to understand yourself um, that a lot of other subjects don't really tackle. Well, James, come back to the skills, talent, and, and the nurturing of that. And, and let me kind of ignite that by saying, if you want to learn to draw, and I'll stay with drawing because it's a good, simple version of, of everything, um, draw, draw every day, keep drawing, just draw, and you'll get better at drawing. Mm -hmm. Then seek out instruction, make good use of books, make good use of other people's works, get the corrections if you can uh, from a good teacher, uh, and then draw. So how does is that the right path? Does that apply to other visual arts as well? Mm -hmm. And if so, how does that apply to other? Because if I'm drawing well, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be a good science student. Yeah. Um, so uh, once again, I'm going to, uh, I want to broaden that notion about what it is that we do when we're studying art. I, I, rem I, rem I remember when I was an elementary school teacher, one of my students made this offhanded remark about that you know, oftentimes when he came to my class, he, f he enjoyed it because he was also learning social studies as well, uh, because we were, we were looking at 
um, looking for content and context for the things that we're thinking about and doing and drawing and exploring. Um, and so it wasn't just about teaching a skill. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll go a step further um, that uh, we sometimes uh, uh, narrow uh, our understanding of what, the, what we do when we make art to this notion of forming things, whether it be through our handwriting on a, uh, you know, on a, on a, on a page or, or building something out of clay or, build, or, or constructing something out of cardboard. Um, but it's not just about, I would argue, uh, just by evidence uh, about forming things. It's also about informing our, our, our knowledge bases, our conversations. This is why that, the notion of context and stories matters. Um, it's also about transforming the questions that we ask. So it's about forming, informing, and transforming. All these things happen within the context of making and practicing art. It's not just about, uh, because it crosses that border into the designed world, everything that you see, including the, this, this thing behind me is a designed object. Um, but that started with uh, uh, explorations, uh, understandings of what, uh, what, uh, 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 ideas that might come from other cultures and that get in, adapted and reinterpreted. Um, but so, so there's a lot of things that are happening within the arts uh, such that uh, I think the, the person, I think it was Caroline who mentioned that, uh, or uh, the, the idea that everybody is uh, an artist uh, in some form or shape, but maybe they haven't discovered it yet. I would go a step further that sometimes our schooling uh, purges us from an understanding of our uh, uh, the, the creative access that we have, even just by interacting with one another. Uh, that how does that, for everybody, how does that work? Because I don't think I'm diminished in that. I feel like I was in, you know, kind of a B level, maybe a B plus level artist. And I feel like I'm still kind of a B plus level artist. I have more art supplies now though. Right. <laughs> but, but other than that, um, like I haven't, I have the earliest sketchbooks from high school. I mean, I've improved, but I have it hasn't made a huge difference. So I would tend more towards, hey, dude, that's what you got. Those are the cards you would dealt. Make the best of those. But if you want to aspire up here, you're probably going beyond your, you're probably going to try to box beyond your weight. So Trinity, how do you teach kids how to expand? how to respect the limits they've got, how to blow through them and how to do the best with what they've got. Like that's an interesting combination that you don't really have another subject, maybe music, maybe gym or physical education. Well, you're in luck because I happen to also be a musician. That's actually, I was a double major in um, undergrad, a pianist um, and then an artist. I don't know. Like I said, I'm a storyteller. So, yeah. you know, we do it all. Um, I think my perspective may be a little bit different than maybe someone like, um, like Andrew, because I work in adult ed, but it starts like at age 16 and up. What I can speak to that is most of the majority of the folks that I work with who are, I'll, I'll name again, are, are immigrants, 99% immigrant population. The immigrant population that I'm working with uh, is... <laughs> they have a very limited educational background to begin with. So when, um, and, and I'm working more with like low income populations. So when they're coming from their countries, they don't actually have even just K-12 education already. And then on top of that, even more layered to the marginalization of not having any art education. Now, when I say the art education, I, I'm limiting that, right? I'm talking about what we as US Americans may see as being art education. What they do have is their culture. And that is what I was talking about before. When, you, when you're storytelling through your own identity. And that is, I think, even in just the ways that we have limited the language of saying what art is or what visual arts means. Or even I think earlier you said, well, drawing. Like it's such a limited perspective into a lens of really what encompasses actual visual arts. So what I have done with my students and I have continued to empower them with is the notion of like Caroline said, you're already an artist. 
you see, I have, I have people that come into my class, they've never held a paintbrush before, right? Let alone they can write their name because they're illiterate in their own native language, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm dealing with that spectrum. But what I tell them is, wait, don't you weave? Don't you make hammocks? Oh yeah, I do that. Well, that's art. You know, don't you, you know, don't, don't you dance in some way? Oh yeah, of course. Or Hmong students, you know, like every single culture and Andrew touched upon this earlier has an original storytelling. And when we get back to that room that Chrissy wasn't in and that none of us were in, when, when we talk about colonization and when we talk about stripping people of their culture, the first thing that is to go besides language is art. That is the form of storytelling. So when we talk about this grand scheme of what we look at with the institutionalized versions of education and the boxes that we're in today, that is why it's been purged. That is why it was stripped away because we were taking people you know, their culture away to Americanize them. And so I think the surge of the change and the shift of what we minds are thinking about with art and the empowerment of that, it's really to get back to us and our souls and our storytelling and our identity and lift that back up and build coalitions because art is really everything. And I, I'm gonna get off my soapbox, but like this, I'm just so strong about this because we really do limit ourselves with the language that we speak. And if we just broaden that, just the language piece itself, I think that would speak just volumes to who is creating this curriculum and why it needs to be more of a, a flexible instrument versus so compartmentalized in what we have decided or the people before us have decided what that looks like. So this is a bit like if you talk to people who operate trains, it was very difficult for them to understand that they're really in the transportation business, right? So widening the view, it's a similar issue with physical education and health education. Um, one of the things that we talked about on that episode was you guys really need to move away from, we are the people who teach you how to exercise. You need to move towards we teach you how to keep your body healthy, not only for through K-12, but through your whole life, right? Makes sense. It seems to me, and I'm sure that I'm the last one of this group to figure this out, that you guys really need to ditch the art thing and the visualization thing and go into the storytelling business. Like, I don't understand why we're separating writing from art, because, I mean, I kind of do both, and I love... Ray's notion of the graphic novels being one of the many, 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 many places where that where those ideas meet up. But you can't tell the story of culture without the story of music. You can't pull those pieces together. And yet we do because we have this very old fashioned guys in the room making decisions design on what school ought to be. And it doesn't make any sense to me. And it makes even less sense to me now that I'm listening to you. We really, and, and by the way, food, just as a little asterisk, right? I mean, it's like, why aren't we treating food as part of this as well? So I want to blow the whole thing up. Drew, would you want to do it with me? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Indeed. It's, it's um, I, I don't know. I know we're, we're, we're taking turns here, but I. No, no, we're not. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but I, I, I the, the notion of having to rethink how we, um, I feel sometimes we're in the Groundhog Day where we're oftentimes coming back to the same place where we're trying to justify why the arts are, are not just um, nice, but they're necessary um, and having to justify it over, all over again to that group of guys you're talking about in the room who made those decisions. And, and, and so I agree that there's, there's something about the language it's, that is often used, and, and it's not just by art, art, artists or art teachers, it's, it's, um, it's a part of the the culture thinking about the arts as you know okay you have the talent you're talented you can draw so that you means you're an artist you're not talented or i don't see your ability to draw so you're not an artist as if you know all artists are the same or have the same skill levels and all the different things you can do to to make art and which are thousands of ways um so it's it's so we're missing something if we say that it's just about this skill Right. So, uh, and going back to something that Trinity was saying, I, I, I uh, oftentimes frame this as uh, 
uh, in order to get at that storytelling, to get at that writing, the fact that, you know, I, you, we used to write all the time in my art classroom, uh, uh, you know, the idea that art is a work of identity, it, uh, but, and, and likewise, identity or our identities are, is a work of art. It's what's one of the things that the arts bring forth, uh, uh, illuminate and, uh, and, and cast out uh, into the public uh, uh, discourse in terms of who is who and why we are all human beings, even though we, we traffic in different uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, circles. Ray, what do you think? I love it all. I mean, I love, I mean, this is awesome though, being in a room of art educators, right? This is uh, often like, there's a little bit of, right, like we're preaching to the choir here, right? We all, are, I think, are many, in many ways on the same page, but like, um, yeah, so many things. I've been taking notes too, just, um, but getting back to like one of your earlier questions, Howard, um, you know, arts are where they are in a lot of ways because of the system of education that we have, that like it's built in a way that it is creating a hierarchy. And um, one, of the, one of the examples I always go back to whenever I think about this is if you walk into a classroom of kindergartners and you ask them, how many of you are gonna be artists when you grow up? Every single hand raises, right? When you walk into a room of high schoolers, how many of you are gonna be artists? None of them raise their hand or they might point at the one art kid, you know, and be like, that's the kid. And so something happens between those two points, right? Which has literally kind of sucked out that like desire to be creative in that way. Um, I think uh, uh, Sir Ken Robinson has, you know, a lot of people have seen his TED talk talking about creativity and the work he's done. Like he has a lot of perspectives on that around um, how our current schooling models literally like kill creativity. Um, and we don't highlight the skills that we learn and we don't, we, we, we silo all the arts into that nice to have versus understanding actually how much they cross over into everything. Um, there's another point that um, Andrew made earlier around literacy and talking about like reading and and I you know I, I do think that's really important and there's also like the idea of visual literacy and that like everybody in the world is constantly looking at things right and everything around us we need to learn how to read. And we do that by building our skills through things like the visual arts. We learn how to read um, the signage, the messaging, uh, media, video games, everything that, like, like this is a generation now is constantly bombarded by visual media. And we have also at the same time kind of stripped away the ability and the skills to, for them to like critically look at some of those things or understand what's happening. And it's one of the reasons why I think visual art education is actually even more important. And again, how it crosses over all disciplines. Like there's just, you know, there's so much there, like, and there's so much that needs to be fixed. That's why when you're like, let's blow it all up. I'm like, yes, I'm on board. I'm like excited to do that because, um, you know, I want, I want students to be able to practice those visual skills, which is one of the reasons why kids, I think become attuned to being like, I can't do this, I can't draw. It's because we never let them practice. We don't encourage them to practice because we yes. tell them you're either talented or you're not. There's an economic component to this too that we often forget that doesn't get mentioned, so I'm mentioning it. I wrote a book a few years ago called The Creative Professional. It's a business book for creative people. Um, and I wanna read you the beginning. It's out of print, so I'm not trying to sell books. I just wanna give a sense of scale. In the United States, roughly 150 million, now about 160 million people work full time. By my count, at least 5 million work in creative professions. We are writers and performers, musicians and visual artists, marketers and strategists, architects and specialists to invent, improve or bring ideas to life. In total, more people work as creative professionals in the United States than doctors who only have 700,000, lawyers only 800,000, accountants 1,300,000, and engineers, 1.6 million combined. The no, number of creative professionals roughly equals the number of people who teach in the United States. It's a huge number. It's one of the largest professions in the United States. One in 25 people in the United States works as a creative professional, or one in 25 workers. Our output, which provides that employment for lawyers and accountants and all of that, is responsible for 7% of the U.S. GDP. In Britain, creative endeavors account for about six. In most Western nations, creative contributions hover around 6%. Global workforce, about 10 million creative professionals. So compare that to mathematicians. Compare that to people who use mathematics as part of their 
job. It ends up being we're bigger. Now, we're bigger, but we aren't necessarily just using visual arts. We also have a few friends in, in performing arts and the like. But this is a huge business that is becoming larger and larger and larger. And yet it seems to occupy a smaller and smaller portion of the K through 12 hours. You're holding your own, but you're not making the progress that needs to be made. And then there's creativity. So creative, whether you tie creativity to imagination or you tie it to innovation or you tie it to practical progress and change, um, or you tie it to clear thinking and you go back to the seas and all of that stuff. Um, creativity is a weird animal. <laughs> it's just, it's really hard to define. It comes very naturally to some people. It becomes really difficult to pass it on. Some of it, much of it, you learn through observation and by trying. Some of it you try to put into a curriculum, but it kind of it's kind of like the Nickelodeon slime stuff where it just kind of runs through your fingers. You got to use it, otherwise it kind of fades away. And then you go, oh, wait a second, I know how to do this. Caroline, enlighten us. Um, I just want to touch on what you were talking about, kind of like the economic factor of all of this. I've actually been writing um, a paper all year this year for one of my classes on the starving artist stereotype and how that affects young artists, but yeah. also up and coming artists. And when I interviewed all my peers, almost all of them could recount a time when their parents, counselors, etc., had told them, don't pursue art you're not, you can't make anything out of it. But when I interviewed professional artists, they said they got very angry about it. They were like, absolutely, this is not true. Like all of them, um, but it's also like, there's a very heavy entrepreneurial aspect to that. Those professional artists who made it. And that's another thing that is not really being taught in school. And in some ways, art and entrepreneurship are not so different. The fundamental skills that you need to have, like risk-taking, um, experimentation, um, creativity, just to be an entrepreneur, I don't think they're that different. Um, and in terms of education, I feel that art is seen as worthwhile only for those with talents or affinities for art. And it's just an option. But like you were talking about for math, like I'm terrible at math, but I still took calculus, you know? And that's, those are kind of my thoughts on that. Cool. Good. Andrew, what are you thinking? I don't believe in talent at all. I think some people have good experiences early on in a subject, whatever that subject may be, math, running, um, reading, uh, art making, singing. And because they had that early good experience, they work harder at it, they're more excited by it, and they go in deeper. Now that's not to say that we're all created equal with that ability, but the how much you your natural affinity for it matters far less than your interest in it having a good teacher and and really how you explore it and then when we th think about broadening that out and and not just like your ability to draw but really what art is for there's been this idea and we've touched on it that you know there's art specific skills and that is really about how we make art and th that's not that's not unimportant, but it's not the most important. And what we're doing now is we're going from that how we make art into why we make art. And we make art because we're human, because we are exploring those human commonalities between us and we are expressing things and we are wanting to um, let our voices be heard. And, and that's really where we're, where we're changing in arts education. And there's all kinds of other like uh, models that are rising up where art isn't kind of its own silo, but where it's part of things in a different way. So arts integration, there's a lot of that going on where arts is how you're delivering everything. And while you're learning how to do everything at the same time or STEAM, I'm a huge proponent of STEAM education where you're taking kind of a STEM model, which is already kind of an interdisciplinary model that's very technically focused. And then you're adding the arts to kind of give it a human focus. So you're thinking, okay, how can we broaden out this economically focused, 
you know, get let get everyone ready to start their own business or become an engineer and use the humanities and the arts specifically to kind of make that more applicable to not just technical problems, but human problems. And as you said, a lot of jobs, and there's a lot of jobs in the arts, and there's a lot of jobs that you're not in the arts. It's not a correct creative field, but you need those same skills that you're learning within the arts. So thank you, um, Chrissy. And I'm gonna go around to everybody real briefly. So what are you working on now as an artist or what have you worked on recently or what do you intend to do? And what's the story behind it? Try to do it in less than a minute. We'll go around the horn. I expect that everybody is working on something or has or will. Well, I love that Andrew was just talking about um, the integration of subjects because I'm right in the middle of uh, one of my favorite things that I do with seven and eighth graders, which is a project called Voices of Change, which is basically them picking a social justice issue that they care about and they're researching the history of it. They're going into the social and cultural context. Um, For example. They're listening to personal stories. So we have students that are looking at gun violence. Um, students are looking at racial inequities, healthcare inequities, things that they personally either feel uh, affected by or just see as an issue that they are looking for a way to solve. So they're using art, but they're, they're pulling in all of these other disciplines because I don't think that art should be taught in a silo. I think it needs to have all of these other things to make it relevant and person, personally meaningful to kids' lives. Good, you. Um, in my art class, we're currently working um, with an organization called the Memory Project. And so they've connected us with um, children in India and Pakistan, and we exchange art with them and create that connection. Um, there are also students who have at some point um, lost their families and um, are with foster um, parents or foster families at the moment. And so um, being able to reach across the world and uh, create a connection with them through art has been really powerful. Cool. James, I'm hoping you're going to say you're not just administrating. <laughs> no, no, I, I, um, I guess the, the largest, the project, the larger scope, um, you know, you mentioned that you uh, um, the book that you, you, you drew upon and, and drew that quote from. Um, I wrote a book about creativity a few years ago, Swarm Intelligence, which is about the social origins of creativity, that it's not this innate uh, uh, ability that individuals have boxed in their heads, but it actually we draw upon one another like we draw upon one another to, in order to learn languages. But um, the, the, the way I'm going with it is that I'm writing a new book called The Next Creative Leap, and especially in this era, as we enter this post-pandemic era, era, we're in the middle of a uh, we're going to discover that we're, we're all post-traumatic, right? Um, it's, uh, we've been through a crisis. Um, and I'm interested in how the arts are the catalyst that we need and historically have been so uh, in order to spur our, our personal individual resilience and also renaissances uh, culturally in, in terms of civilizations past uh, and that we're going to need to draw upon that going forward. Cool. Mm -hmm. Caroline. Um, recently, as this summer and this coming spring break, I've been painting um, socially justice, social justice oriented murals uh, local to me, kind of in Alexandria, Old Town, Falls Church, all in Northern Virginia. And right now I'm working with a foundation called the Tinner Hill Heritage Foundation. Um, so there's one woman I've become in contact with and she has a bunch of photos of people in her family that represent um, the historic area of Tinner Hill. And um, it's recognized as one of the, uh, the birthplace of one of the first branches of the NAACP, which I think is really interesting. And it has such a rich history. It really overlaps with my passion for um, just social studies and history in general. And I've had many passionate conversations with her and I'm taking these photos and helping her make a mural district to better her community. Cool. It's funny how we say art or visual art, but what we're really talking about even goes beyond storytelling into a very active mode of learning, right? It's just you, people who are doing art do stuff. Like it, it may not be making stuff, but you do stuff. You're in the community. You're doing things. Andrew, I'm hoping you're not just an administrator, not to diss that, but I'm hoping you're making some art too. Well, my last piece of art was writing the uh, Virginia State Standards for Visual Art, but my next one is a little bit more excited. Did exciting. you at least do that like in many colors or something? To... Uh, not so much. <laughs> but my next one is a little bit more exciting. I'm uh, 
uh, working on making a television show. Um, it's actually STEAM focused and it's uh, looking at, uh, it's part of our distance learning uh, things that we're doing for Alexander City Public Schools. And I'm well within making the first three episodes and hopefully it all goes out in the next few weeks here. There you go, Ray. Um, you know, teaching is a constant thing, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. you know, when I've got that extra time. Um, I've been working actually, uh, the, a thing I've been really excited about, I've been collaborating with a couple other folks. We do this monthly visual DEI chats. So we've been inviting people to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And how do we visualize that as facilitators? How do we create entry points for those visualizations? And then we'll, along with one of those people, we've also been it's a long kind of built up project where we're thinking about how do we visualize the Asian American experience in this country. And I think it's something, especially for me, really personal, especially with some of the recent violence against Asian American communities, how are we kind of building up, holding up, lifting up those communities and thinking about doing that in ways that are visualizing them, like bringing it into a way that is clear, concise and helps communicate how rich the Asian American experience is in this country. So that's something I'm hoping to like start to build up and then be able to release soon. Um, yeah, that's what's happening now. Another observation, we do projects, you know, the, the folks who are elsewhere in the education system talk about the importance of project based learning. And we're all I think you guys are all looking at each other going, how is that new? How is that a fresh idea? We've been that's all we do. We've been doing this for a long time. So uh, Trinity, tell us about your I have a lot going on, but I'm going to talk about one in particular. And I also do just want to do a quick shout out of Jiwoo and Caroline. It's like super evident that our youth is like pushing the needle forward in such an impactful and positive way. I just, I just want to just acknowledge that. Um, so I'm working currently with the Institute of Anti-Racist Education um, to create content uh, with a few of my students and student alumni um, who identify as trans women immigrants. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a large caravan that came from El Salvador and we inherited a lot of those students at our school. So it's been really amazing and powerful to listen to their stories about, you know, how they used art to, um, to lift up their stories, to elevate their identities, to really reconnect to an identity as they came here to the United States. So that is like the current small project that I'm doing. That's really exciting. So again, another observation about this, it's never one thing. It's always a bunch of stuff and I'm working with this one and I'm thinking about this and this is early stage. I, I mean, I work with a lot of people in a lot of parts of the education, learning, school business. Those people don't talk this way. But you do, and I do. So let me add my little stuff to the pile. So, you know, one of my great concerns is that we are enormously stupid about health. We just don't have public health. We don't know what it is. We don't know how to deal with it. We let these pandemics go out of control. We probably need to do some major media thing to put public health into the center of the circle. Now, is that graphic novels? Is that a podcast? Is that an amusement park? Is that like or a theme park? What could that be or what group of things could that be? So for me, process is every bit as important as output, right? So process for me is, well, I don't know anything about public health. That's one of the reasons I'm doing it is because I always step into stuff that I know nothing about. And then I ask people who are way smarter than I am and they tell me and then we go, oh, that's a good thing. Um, so my first question is, what are the first, what are the five, 10 biggest public health issues? Let's get a bunch of really smart public health people together in a virtual room, spend a few hours together and make a list. So James, I may ask you for some help because I'm sure Syracuse has that person. Um, and uh, so part one, part two, how do we reach people? Is it better to do something in print? Is it better to do a musical? Is it like, what's the form? And then the third is, so what's the creative approach that we take and who are the people we want to bring into the tent? So take that, put it over there. I'm working on another project about diabetes. We've written an adult book, but we really think you have to get into the supermarkets. So now I'm beginning to move from writer into marketer, but I'm also really curious whether the best way to teach a 
teenage diabetic or a pre-teenage diabetic is through a graphic novel. So I kind of, I'm, I'm very aware of the importance in, in, in that space. Um, and then there's like these puppets that I, that we built for another project that helped me learn. And a lot of other people learn about the sustainable development goals and they're sitting in storage and I can't figure out what to do with them, but they speak to me every week or two going, get us out of these boxes, please. So we can do something because we want to be productive and you're, and we're rotting because we only have a 15 year lifespan before we melt. So, um, and, and on, right. And then by the way, I'm obsessing about watercolor pigments and what combinations and all that stuff, just because, you know, you need to go someplace and into your quiet, crazy place. So people I know, and now I know you guys who think this way, I think are markedly different from other people, always degrees. But when we talk, look how animated we've been. Look how excited we are about these projects. Look how connected to the world we are by doing this and how good it feels. And yet I feel like we're very much the minority. I feel like when I go off and talk about my 17 projects, the other people at dinner go, shut up, Can I... enough, just leave us alone. <laughs> so, so James, what's going on here? Yeah, I'm glad you asked me that because I, because I, 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 you're, you're onto something here, which is really important uh, that we should point out. One of the reasons why we have this common approach, you're, you're getting at it, your 17 projects, um, those who are uh, in the creative sphere or who are acquainted with their creativity think in terms of connections um, as opposed to compartmentalizations. Yeah. Um, we, we don't silo, we see, uh, and we see it, it, it becomes this thing where we, we make these connections. So for example, um, I'm also like uh, Andrew, I'm working on a, on a, on a uh, television project. I'm this uh, main script consultant for a, uh, a new uh, Jim Henson uh, company production, uh, which features a young male artist of color who is a creator, who is a processor, who's who, and I can't give the title yet. They're yeah. trying to, uh, uh, we're close to getting green lighted through PBS. But Great. the point is to be able to tell that story um, about how we navigate and make it, because ultimately what we do in the art studio is an iterative process. We we take, we experiment, we learn from what we did, and then we go on and say, now what if I, what if? Well, now why not? And that's that's the animation that you're seeing um, in all of us um, because we're acquainted this, we're acquainted with this, and no one should be denied access to that kind of space, right? Because that's what that's what makes us um, uh, uh, a civilization, passing along our gifts to the next generation. But we have gifts, mm -hmm. so. That's a problem, right? Because Andrew, with all due respect about talent, this is a pretty talented group of people. Having worked as a producer, putting together those kinds of television shows, there's a difference between the people who step up and do the costume, do the concept, get the writing done, make it funny, get the timing of the joke right, get the music right and all that. Those are very talented people. They are the best. Now, do I think anybody can be trained for that? No way. Do I think a small number of people have an affinity for that and then can get up a, a couple of levels and then a lot of levels and then learn from one each other? Absolutely. But I think it's a special class. Not to exclude everybody else, but you get so good at it and you become part of a team. Is that my own prejudice about this? And I'm willing to, for you to kind of push it back in my face, but... It seems to me that those people are different, Andrew. Yes. Raising I think you've got it completely backwards, honestly. I think we all have that at birth. What we do is we lose it. it most people start thinking about things. I have two seven-year-olds. They're amazing. But everything is 20 projects. Everything is. And when I worked with little kids, all the little kids are like that. That is part of who we are as human beings. What happens is we get put into boxes and we start believing in those boxes. And some people, because of their parents, because of their teachers, because of their school system, whatever, are taught, oh, okay, those boxes are just artificial, see past them. But a lot of people never do. And that's what we can help change is open those, open their eyes and see that that box is, is something they can get out of real quick. How do we get that power? That's, that's a pretty powerful indictment um against 
a very large system of people who are doing things in the same way they've been doing for a very long time. You're saying, no, take the power away because they're doing it wrong. That's what I'm hearing you say. I agree with you, by the way. I don't. I, I think but what you're saying is radical and dangerous and revolutionary. Well, I mean, we've had this conversation before. I mean, John Dewey was having this conversation 100 years ago saying education currently is set up for this industrial model where everyone is, you know, trying to punch in, punch yeah, out sure. of time and learn this. One but you're suggesting the opposite. Lens. Yes. But he said he was saying 100 years ago that that was all rubbish and that that's not what we should be doing. And we How'd have that go? Pendulum. How'd that go for him? It went well at first, but we have a pendulum in education in this country. And you have to understand that when we start to get to a more progressive model, something happens or political groups happen that say, oh, we aren't comfortable with that. We want to go back to the way things were done when I was a kid. And this is, this is just too out there for me. So let's move it back to this other side. And there's other aspects of this, of course, but I think that, that the fact that our public schools are run by policy that is by non-educators, almost all of it, it doesn't allow us to have some of the same freedoms. And, and we, are, we are starting to educate those policymakers, but it takes a lot of time. And then we, every step forward, we have another step back. Okay, but we're grown ups and we have to look to you and Caroline in the eye saying, no, we got the ball. Don't worry about it. Or we're saying we've completely screwed this up. Good luck with it. I hope it works out for you guys. So how much responsibility are we just, you know, how much of this are we just kicking down the road? Like, at what point do we go, we're changing that now and Trinity's going to change it for us? I, <laughs> I think we're all part of the change. Um, it's a, a little quick thing I had, I just wrote it down. I think talent, the word talent is an exclusionary word for stunting growth. Um, and, and it goes back to the language, right? Like how do we use empowering and inclusive language to, to make change? If we're looking at the superstructure of what we are under in a very binary world in a very capitalistic nation, then our ideas would be considered radical. Then what Andrew just said would be considered radical. But for us who live and breathe and experience it every day and really don't know any other way, it isn't radical, it's humane. It's what makes us who we are. And so until we burn those boxes and until we dismantle this super structure of hierarchical you know, positionalities of, of how education looks and, and just everything and, and the policies and structures, then there really can't be too much crazy radical change because that superstructure still lives. So I think as we continue in our generations, it's, it's, it's not to kick the can down to the next generation to do all the work, but we need to chip away here and there and, and be louder and use those platforms and use social media and use you know all of the people and have tough conversations. It's not like one big thing is gonna change it. It's, it's a lot of us doing smaller things to getting to that larger thing. So that, that's all I'm gonna say on James, that. James, when people do a lot of small things, does that usually result in larger change? Yes, uh, in the sense that um, we're getting at that notion of this whole title here, reinventing school. Um, schooling systems are, by nature, um, being systems, uh, they're resistant to change. Um, and if you're going to intervene in any kind of system, whether it's uh, for, for good or for ill, there you have to take systemic pathways. And so small interventions um, in, in, uh, in combination can definitely have, even a single intervention, frankly, uh, can, if it's the right intervention, can really uh, dismantle or blow up the death star, so to speak. And I'm just using a, a pop culture na analogy. But yeah, not, that it, not that it has yeah, anything yeah, to do with yeah. anything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but a lot of small interventions can also have a similar effect. Um, as long as we understand that we're dealing with a system that's going to resist. Um, and yet, Clayton Christensen, and yet those incremental changes mm -hmm. really are on the meaningless side. Not to say what well, the work we're doing is meaningless, but in terms of large scale change, it's going to be disruptive innovation, mm -hmm. not incremental innovation, that it will change the way that we think about this. Well, you know, I, I, I would say um, uh, 
the key is what what's the leverage point that you're intervening in? Um, what, what, you know, does it does it give access to um, just surface change, or does it get into the 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 gut of the machine? Um, ultimately, th these are choices that folks make, and it's not it's not necessarily um, uh, a, a given that we are going to know which is the right lever to pull uh, that'll that'll blow it all up. Um, as you as you uh, pointed out as an analogy, uh, but um, you you keep on uh, uh, you keep at it uh, is, is is what I would say, um, and I think this team here, this group here, is is really getting at some of those um, uh, leverage points. I think you're right. Um, I, we, had a, we had a rough day in the last day or so. Um, there was some bad stuff happening in Atlanta this time, but. This time is the key word, because there's always a guy with a gun and a group of people. And somehow we've managed now to export these nasty habits to Brazil and other places as well, where it had not been an issue so much. Now it is. So if we're going to make the change, whatever that change might be, first a nod to what happened yesterday, but a question, and maybe we'll close out with this, is we're talking a lot about creative approaches and people thinking differently and people learning to think differently and doing away with the very rigid ways of thinking about uh, about how society works and how school works. What difference could we have made? Trinity, I know you were very concerned about this. Do you want to jump in? I think Ray has something he wants to say. <laughs> I, Go ahead. I'm sorry, Ray. I, was I, like, yeah, I wanted to jump in because some of the stuff that James is talking about, and I think maybe I'll kind of try to answer that question as well. Here is like, I feel like there's just like large systemic and societal stuff that is really like the, that are part of the barriers, but also like, how are we looking at trying to, too much of the work that I think has been done. And like, I, I'm just as guilty of this in my career is trying to band-aid the systems and trying to like piece together as opposed to kind of thinking about, again, really rethinking completely or reinventing the systems because of the way that they create boxes that just hold us in or that they like bind us. And, and you know, going back again to some of the skills we talked about within art, the arts, it's like that idea of there are these things called the studio habits of the mind. And we talk about things like engaging and, pers engaging and persisting and um, stretching, exploring taking risks. The arts are the one of the most amazing places to fail and fail spectacularly all the time. And that teaches us lessons to then try new things. And along the lines of what James is talking about is we are not going to quit at this. We're going to keep trying different things to find those levers. We're going to work within our spheres of influence that we do have, whether that is for me as a teacher right now, or, you know, James as the president of the NAEA, you know, having this larger reach, we're all kind of doing these pieces. And like, that is like that deep hope and desire we have to like build and create larger systemic change because we believe really passionately and deeply in this work. Um, and it's hard and it can be very frustrating. And like, you know, but we kind of keep at it because of how much, um, you know, I imagine everyone has had very concrete experiences in their lives, like especially in this room of how the arts have helped them see something, open up something, connect to something in a really deep and meaningful way that probably changed the course of our life. And so like, how do we communicate those things to others, to decision makers? And, you know, how do we like help encourage and build up that next generation and people like Jiwoo and, and Caroline do like, you know, to keep having their voice and building and then become those decision makers. You know, one of them is gonna get to that point where they're gonna have maybe that larger influence and be able to make some of those shifts and changes and help us actually like completely rethink the systems because um, you know that's huge and that's really difficult and challenging but like like that's like the work you know that's the work whether that's across race across class across gender sexuality all those different pieces like you know we're doing that work to like always constantly build and, and move forward I'm watching Jiwoo because, of course, when we do Zoom, we see everybody at the same time, right? So I'm watching Jiwoo and um, uh, and Caroline both going through everything that James was saying, through everything that Ray was saying, through everything that Trinity was saying. So uh, I'll give you guys the last word. So um, Jiwoo, what are you thinking when you? How are you processing what you're hearing, and what are you going to do about it? 
I mean, I don't know. I was just thinking about what Ray said about the Band-Aid solutions. And I know earlier we shut down Andrew a little bit for having very radical ideas. But I think going back to the creative thinking, you know, going back to art and like going back to like the creative mind, like this is what allows us to have all of these different thoughts and ideas, you know? If it hadn't been for like stimulating the creative mind and just, you know, going with what is right now, then none of these like solutions or, you know, even if radical, like these ideas would never have come up. And I think it it gives me a lot of hope to see, you know, so many educators and people out there who, you know, know the importance of, you know, being creative and creating solutions um, for the future and looking at, you know, the long term instead of, you know, just right now in the moment. Um, and so I think this conversation gave me a lot of hope. Caroline? Are we hopeless or hopeful? Honestly, I won't lie. I'm a mix of both. Um, I think a lot of students and artists alike share the sentiment with me that a lot of the crises we're going through, like racial issues in America, COVID, the environmental crisis, all of it, it seems so big that I guess someone my age sometimes feels like there's nothing we really can do. Um, but I'm hopeful in the way that all of us are so passionate. Like I've never met a serious artist who does not care. And at the end of the day, art is problem solving. But I also worry that we all have our sort of projects that we work on somewhat individually. And um, I think honestly change can happen if a lot of artists like us came together and chose something to do. Very eloquently stated. Thank you. We Thank got, we you. went much further um, down the road here than uh, than than just visual arts, and I'm really grateful uh, to all of you for your willingness to kind of jump in and be critical and and really think this through. Uh, we're going to roll credits if you guys can hang out just for a couple of minutes afterwards, just to figure out what it is that we just talked about. That's always kind of fun. So we'll see everybody next time and. Uh, Thank you all very, very much for a really good, provocative, fun conversation. Episodes and more, visit our website. Kids on Earth contains hundreds of video interviews with students from around the world. Learning Revolution is a global collaboration network for people who care about learning. Be sure to join us next Thursday for a new episode of Reinventing School. Thanks for watching.